Hello and welcome back, this is the second part of the floating portals tutorial, this is where we left it off last time and that's instead the result that we're working towards. In this episode we'll try to add the trees, the 3D text, the grass, also hopefully the floating effect, but before we can do that I'd like to address something that I didn't mention in the other video and that's that if you are shipping your website in any place that is not the root level of your website then we need to modify a bit the way that we are importing assets from the public folder. So first of all we need to specify the on page of package.json and then every time I'm referencing a path that also includes public URL I have to make sure that it's prepended by a slash. I've applied the same fix to every other file of the project and now after building the project you can drop your distribution files anywhere in your website and not just in the root folder. In my case I'm three folders deep but it works as expected. Okay, now that we got that out of the way we can take a look at the trees components which is very simply using the use loader hook to download a glb file and as soon as we get the mesh from the glb file I'm setting the environment map intensity to 2.5. As a quick reminder the environment map intensity is a property that determines how strong the lighting effect from the background environment map will be on this object. To make sure that it's all clear, this will be the environment map that takes part in that calculation of how strong the lighting effect will be. This environment map instead is only being used as a background because it's blurred. I didn't mention it in the other video but this environment map is not blurred and so that's creating sharp reflections and a good lighting information that we can use instead this one since it's blurred we're only using it as a background. Trees are good to go and now we can take a look at a really interesting component which I'm simply calling words and that contains some 3D text on it. In computer graphics when it comes to rendering text you usually have three options. You can either use a texture that displays your text but that's obviously pretty limited or you can create an actual geometry of your text that contains a bunch of vertices and triangles and this is usually the only way that you can get extruded text like I'm seeing here in Blender or you can use signet distance function if you don't need to extrude your text. Our words will be extruded so our only option is to create a triangulated version of our geometry and that's the purpose of the text 3D component from the Dre library. And this component is extremely simple to use. I've included a fonts folder with a JSON file that contains information about our text. You can download that from the description of the video. And once we have that we can specify where to find the font JSON, then set the size of the text to word units how much the text is going to be extruded and finally how many triangles to use when trying to triangulate the curves of the glyphs of our text. And inside the component we can specify a string to render and a material to apply to the resulting geometry. We also have access to most of the properties that we would normally see in a mesh component and we can specify a position and a rotation to our text components. All that's left to do is to include our trees and words in our scene container and here they are. Now if we zoom in a bit We'll notice that the 3D text is also being extruded a bit. It's not super easy to spot, but it's one of the little details that I thought was cool. Moving on to the grass component, as soon as we load the mesh, we have to make it transparent and also enable alpha to coverage. One thing that is very difficult to do right in computer graphics is to render semi-transparent objects. Especially when rendering foliage, there's a long list of imperfections and artifacts that would show up if we just use normal alpha blending. And without going too much into detail into this topic, I'll just mention that since Reactory Fiber by default en enables MSAA, which is the standard anti-aliasing method for TreeJS, we can use a property called alpha to coverage that does order independent transparency for us. That will greatly help reduce the artifacts of normal alpha blending and give our grass mesh the look that we are after. These remaining properties are just the setup that I like the most and by default the diffuse texture of this GLB file was assigned to the emissive map slot in Blender because I was using an emissive shader. But in TreeJS I would prefer to use this texture as the diffuse map instead and so I have to copy the emissive map in these lots for the diffuse map. And finally, the emissive property makes the mesh emit some radiance and act like a light source. The reason why I'm using it is that foliage can often show some light through even when it's not directly facing a light source and the cheapest way for me to simulate this behavior was to make it emit some light. Which color will depend on the emissive map texture. And after importing the grass component in the scene container we can take a look at the end result and you'll notice that the grass is uniformly lit. No matter where the camera is, no matter the direction where I'm looking at, it's always going to reflect light in a similar way. 
that's because it, again it's almost as if it was acting like a light source uh, it is effectively emitting some light this also creates a problem that i decided that i can live with and the problem is that in a real in a real world scenario the grass that sits under the floating island would be much much darker because it's not receiving as much light from the sun direction but in this case i decided i can live with it because the rest of the grass looks better this way and before we finish off this video i want to add one last feature and that's the float component this is the component that was creating the motion animation in the original scene and all of the children of this component and recursively all the children of each of these components will get this animation. You can choose a few options to customize the animation, I'll let you play with that on your own, and I'm also leaving the floating rocks aside because I want to animate them separately. And the result is pretty cool. You remember that each of these meshes, the rocks, the trees, the portal, the grass, they're separate from each other. They're not really connected. But the float component makes sure that all of its children are kind of grouped together such that in motion they act as a single entity. And I've also updated the floating rocks and I'm wrapping each primitive with a float component. And the only thing that I'm doing different is that I'm also specifying the position in the float component itself instead of the primitive. Last remaining touch for this video is to also apply the float component to our 3D text meshes. And this also proves an interesting property of the float component. It can be applied in a hierarchy. So for example, in this case, the 3D text meshes will be animated by this flow component, but also by the top level flow component that is specified inside scene container. I think that's it for the second part of the series. All of the 3D content that we wanted to display is now being animated on screen. We're still missing obviously the fancy portal shader, but that's going to be the topic of part 3. I hope this one was clear enough. As always, I wanted to remind you that I appreciate all the feedback that I receive on these videos. And stay tuned for the next episode. I promise it's going to be a fun one. So see you soon.